Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Am I on? Yes. My on, marvellous. Thank you. Um, I don't uh, use PowerPoint, I'm afraid, and I should acknowledge that I've aged a lot since that headshot, um, which was taken five years ago. I don't use PowerPoint because I think it's quite dull, and I don't write speeches. And the reason I don't write talks is because I'm very dyslexic and I can't read very well, so I've learnt over the years how to just speak. And that uh, causes the communications team in Stonewall great distress because they never quite know what I'm policy position I might announce. And my dear colleagues from Stonewall who are here today also get a little bit stressed because sometimes I contradict what they've said. But that is the nature of diverse teams and creative approaches to problem solving. So I hope you will be forgiving. Um, I will talk quite frankly today about some of my observations about where I think the world and the nation is at. Uh, I will also speak quite personally. Um, I am a, a fan of social media, except when it's awful and evil and destructive and brings together people in the name of hate. And my mum really doesn't like to see a lot of that hatred. So anything too personal, could you keep it off Twitter if I share anything too personal? But anything general, go ahead. Um, my mum my mum got quite distressed learning about my experience of growing up with her via the medium of 140 characters on Twitter. So I respect her for that and, and I try and take a bit more care about how I talk about these things in public. So Stonewall is 30 years old this year and I have worked there for 14 of those years. I started off at Stonewall as a little baby dyke in 2005 with baggy jeans and a number three haircut and 20 marble lights trying to find my way through a movement that was decidedly what we would describe as assimilationist. And I want to talk about where that's come from and the impact it has on, I think, mental health and well-being of lesbian, gay, bi and trans people today. But if you'll forgive me, I just want to go way back, if you don't mind. Let's go back to the 50s, where it was completely unlawful to be gay in this country. Men were actively persecuted for same-sex relationships. They were accused of uh, soliciting. There were dubious claims made against them, and they were hounded by the state and by the forces that were supposed to protect them. And a lot came out of that time that we still see today, that shame, that anxiety, that belief that one is some different, other, apart from the general population. The 60s and 70s saw changes in that and changes in attitudes generally to freedom and sex, but a bit like, who's seen The Favourite? Not yet. Go and see The Favourite. It's amazing. But The Favourite shows us that Restoration England had great sex and lots of fun and lots of freedom. And then syphilis came in and Queen Victoria got very paranoid and suddenly sex was a dirty word. What happened in the 80s is sex became dirty. And sex became dirty because of HIV, and AIDS, where gay men and men who had sex with men were thought to be wholly responsible for this disease and what was happening. And what happened in those, that late stage of the 80s is that the NHS didn't quite know what to do. The government at the time sent round leaflets with big gravestones on it that basically said, being gay will kill you and kill other people too. And what happened was the LGBT community with the black African community came together and provided services themselves. And the modern Terence Higgins Trust, THT, that you see today was born out of that movement. It was born out of lesbians caring for men as they died. It was born out of people trying to develop their own services. And it wasn't perfect. It wasn't a great way of doing it. What we needed was the NHS stepping up and providing that support. But a lot of the anxiety about health and social care remains from that time when you'd go in with an ingrown toenail and they'd say, yes, but you're a gay man, you must be HIV positive. All that anxiety, the insurance policies that said if you were gay, you couldn't be insured. Your workplace that could discriminate against you and fire you for being lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans. All that tension and anxiety came through those moments. And Stonewall was set up in response to something called Section 28. And Section 28, who, who knows about Section 28? Let's see your generational learning. Excellent. Section 28, a piece of legislation that prevented the promotion of homosexuality in schools. Because when someone wants to stop someone learning something, we know from history the best thing to do is ban books. That always goes down well in social development. 
They banned the books based on a book called Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, a book of very dubious quality that is deadly dull and is 36 pages of a little girl called Jenny who lives with her dad Eric and his boyfriend Martin. And they are seen doing lots of different things. And about halfway through that book, there is what we call in Wales a scene that is described as a morning kutch, where Jenny gets into bed with Eric and Martin and talks about her day. This was considered to be such high risk to an entire generation of young people who would become rampant homosexuals having seen that scene, the decision was made to ban that book. I was uh, seven years old, growing up in a small Catholic primary school with Cinderella, Snow White, and uh, constant messages, I'm still Catholic, so that, that's for a whole other presentation, uh, constant messages of heterosexuality, but despite that, I still managed to come out as a lesbian. So we, we believe that literature doesn't turn anybody anything and actually just creates a better environment. But Stonewall was set up. Ian McKellen, uh, Gandalf or Magento, depending on your cultural reference point, uh, got together with Michael Cashman, Lisa Power, and set up Stonewall. And Stonewall was intended to be a purely non-democratic lobbying organisation that would do everything it could to achieve full legal equality for lesbian, gay and bi people. At the time, a trans movement was burgeoning uh, called Press for Change. And what was happening in trans communities is that if you were rich enough and you had enough kind of resources, you could transition without too much hassle. And then a woman took uh, her husband to court for a divorce and the judge said, you're not a woman, you were born a man and therefore your marriage wasn't even valid. And thus the informal rights that had been understood and held by trans people were suddenly eradicated. So Press for Change pursued legislative change and Stonewall pursued legislative change and the two of us worked simultaneously to make the world a better place. And it was pretty rough. So we had a generation of older men who'd been told that everything they did was illegal. We had a generation of older women who didn't exist and weren't acknowledged in any way, shape or form, except to suggest that any kind of same-sex attraction was a mental illness, hysteria that you should be kind of, you know, you, you not wanting to love your husband and love a woman instead was an indication of quite complex mental health issues. And we then had a generation of men who were dying. And a generation of men who were dying without the support of the state. Then we told a whole group of kids that same-sex families would pretend and that being homosexual was something to be ashamed of. So I give you that context to indicate, is it no wonder we're a little bit messed up? because intergenerational trauma remains today. And when you grow up in a context of someone being told that you're other, that you're inferior, that what you want, what you feel, what you desire is not acceptable, that will leave a mark. However resilient you are, however much you decide to try and find a counter narrative, that will leave a mark. So when I was 13 and came out, my parents were absolutely devastated. You know, working class family, uh, I was bright, I was a bright kid, I was doing well, the word Oxford had been bandied round with great excitement and here I was choosing to like girls. And not only was I choosing to like girls, I was choosing to be really gay about it. Because fancying girls is one thing, having short hair and quite liking your tailored three-piece suits and ties is a bit too much. So I had a double shame. I had a double shame that I fancied girls and that I really liked to strut in a three-piece suit. And my parents didn't get that. They didn't get why I would want to bring this trouble down on myself. And it was, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, because when you change your mind, everyone will know and you will never, ever get a job. Do not tell anyone when you go for your interview at Oxford. Do not tell anyone when you're at Oxford. Don't tell anyone when you get made president of your junior common room, because it'll be on your record forever. You won't get president of the student union, Ruth, because they know you're gay and you won't get it. And then when I was president of the student union, don't let anybody know because you'll never get a job. And that, even though I was counteracting that narrative and I've had a lot of therapy, so I know they couldn't help it, it leaves a mark. Even if you say, no, I'm all right. I'm all right. It still leaves a mark. So Stonewall in its first 15 years lobbied pretty consistently on legal change and it looks easy now, you rattle through them. Age of consent, gays in the military, adoption. In 2004 we had Civil Partnership Act, Press for Change achieved something called the Gender Recognition Act that acknowledged for the first time that people could 
be acknowledged by law in their what we call acquired gender. So someone who is a woman and presented as a woman is a woman. They don't need to go through surgery. They don't need hormones. They don't need the approval of the North London feminists who write The Spectator. If they say they are a woman, they are a woman. And that was pretty amazing bit of legislation in 2004 that if you read the press now has been completely forgotten as actually what the law says. The law is very clear. Trans women are women, trans men are men. And those two bits of legislation in 2004 were incredible. Probably the single most significant bits of legislation. And then Stonewall's challenge was how do we change hearts and minds? And that's what we proceeded to do. We did lots of research. We work with organizations. We work with diversity champions. We now work with 800 employers. We work with 2,000 schools. We conduct lots of research. Stonewall has 160 staff. And we work very, very hard to move the needle. With the gentlest of hands and the kindest of eyes and the most pragmatic response and approach, we very politely try and move the needle. My key people are the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the security services and Premier League football teams, and much of the conversations with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the football teams are the same. Um, yes, you do have gay staff. Uh, yes, it's worth acknowledging that there may be well gay bishops and gay football players. It's, it's a similar chat, if I'm honest. But if I look at where we're at now, where we're at now is that we have, what Stonewall would say, acceptance for a significant proportion of lesbian and gay people, and I use that word deliberately, if we are good enough, if we're not too camp, if we're not too butch, if we're rich enough to demand our own kind of health care, if we are in a nice civil partnership and marriage where our infidelity is discreetly handled over there, you know, if we don't talk about anything that is complicated, if we don't present a messy portrayal of our lives, that what humanity is, is messy. If you're lesbian and gay and in a relatively privileged position, it is easier now. If you are white, it is easier now. But I would say that even in that category, those people will still avoid sitting on the night bus and holding hands with their partner. They will still change their mind when they walk down a street as to whether it's safe or not. The difference is, is that we've accepted what we would call those microaggressions as part and parcel of society. Now, I'm a professional gayer, so I've got a lot of a kind of confidence and authority in my identity. But when I walk down the street with my partner, and we are both in our three-piece suits, the homophobia is disproportionately high. Fucking dykes, how dare you be here? How are you allowed to be here? How do you dare take up space? It's how do you take up space in this world that is not designed for you? By communities, as you heard from that research then, do not disclose and are often dismissed and are told that what they are is pretend and they haven't made up their mind yet. Trans communities are facing the biggest level of hatred and backlash I have ever seen in my career in this whole area. In the last 14 years of my work, I have never seen so much hostility founded in misinformation, inaccurate truths and designed to dehumanize an entire population. Do I think that's because people are particularly educated and interested in trans issues? No. Do I think there are legitimate questions to be asked about trans issues? Yes, as there were about Catholics adopting gay couples, as it was about marriage and same-sex. There are always questions to be asked. The dehumanizing nature of the articles and the rhetoric against trans people is a disgrace. And what we will see is an increase in mental health issues in our trans communities, an increase in hate crime. And it is symbolic of the fact that we are currently, as a nation, lacking leadership, lacking security, and lacking an ability to solve problems, work creatively, and demonstrate generous leadership to each other. When Parliament can't work out what to do, that infects a population. The insecurity about otherness is flooding our nation, and that will affect migrants, that will affect black people, that will affect trans people, and it will affect the butch dykes, and it will affect the camp men, until those people who are nicely secure, who are affluent and are doing all right, will suddenly experience that discrimination too. So what does that mean? It means that we all have to take very seriously this notion about how we can be truly inclusive of everyone who comes through our door. We have to recognize that that is a cultural goal that we must all continue to work at. You can do a bit of DNI. You can do your women last week and your gay this week and let's do a bit of trans next week. But in fact, unless you are thinking very seriously about reforming your entire cultural approach to generous leadership, inclusive leadership, enabling everybody to find a voice and play a role, that culture will seep into everything. And you are at the vanguard of changing that. 
So I would leave you with just a final message in that I'm a frequent flyer of the NHS. I have a diagnosis called sarcoidosis, which means that uh, the NHS thinks I sometimes have lymphoma and sometimes think I have a cough, and, and we kind of just work, work on that basis. And I'm under the care of guys and Tommies, and every interaction I have with the hospital porter all the way up to the surgeon, utterly inclusive and respectful. Except I got a letter from one consultant who said her friend came along and was very supportive. And it killed me because my friend was clearly my partner, and my partner was clearly sat there saying, does she have lymphoma? <laughs> do we need to do something about this? She wasn't my friend who was supportive, and it broke my heart. It doesn't take much to get the language right. It doesn't take much to say, who do you have at home, instead of, is, there a, is your boyfriend coming with you? We ask about bowel movements, we ask about last menstrual cycles, we ask about everything under the sun. We can say, who do you have at home? And for someone who is heterosexual, they will not notice. But I promise you, for someone who is in a same-sex relationship, that is a lifeline that can absolutely change that interaction and that relationship with that health professional. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for all you're going to learn today. Stonewall is here for you in all sorts of ways, whenever you need us. We're working things out too on some areas. And together, I think we can genuinely try and counteract the wave of hatred that is coming across this country and make the world a better place. Thank you very much.